Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and today we're heading to the province of Saskatchewan to sit down with the councillor for Estevan, Saskatchewan. I was going to say Alberta there for a second. I don't know why, but it's actually Saskatchewan, the energy city to be exact. Please help me welcome councillor Tony Sarnik. Councillor, welcome to the show. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for reaching out and uh, can't wait to get through the interview. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a good can't wait or a bad can't wait, but let's see how the interview goes. No, it's, always, it's, it's always good to uh, bring light to uh, the community that we live in and whichever way possible. So Exactly. Be so before we talk about your community, I want to talk about you. Who is Tony? And to start the line of questionings, I'm going to ask the same question I've asked every single politician who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception. Tony, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it came from obviously just being born and raised in the area. Uh, always followed politics a little bit. Uh, obviously, got more involved just uh, probably since the year two thousand. I guess as you get into your twenties, uh, you become more involved and uh, you see what's going on in your city and just the love for the city. But uh, what really, what really struck my interest was like uh, from the year two thousand to twenty twelve and. In, this, in the city of Estevan, there was probably lots of bad or horrible decisions being made on infrastructure. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely more of a meat and potatoes guy, i.e. infrastructure. So, you know, there's lots of horrible decisions. And again, I was in my 20s and 30s, didn't have time to get involved, but always wanted to and always just in the back of my mind said, uh, if I ever get the chance to get involved, I definitely will get involved. So before we talk about that first election, I want to jump back to your childhood because I can imagine when you're when you hit 20, you do get involved in politics. That's when I got interested in politics back in Ontario. But was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was municipal politics something that you followed regularly? Because we always forget about municipal politics. We always remember provincial or federal politics, but municipal politics isn't one that you actually go, well, what's happening with my water? or What's happening with the snowplow? It's more, hey, my property taxes went up. Was municipal politics discussed in the household? Uh, it. It was like uh, we always always knew who the you know the mayors were and the councillors and and that sort of stuff, but it obviously just went about that that far. But uh, growing up as a teenager, you didn't really realize it at the time. But uh, you know, in the in the early '90s and in the '90s, uh, you know, what I mean, Estevan was the place to be from. Kind of, I was I was kind of one of the ones that stuck around the city. Um, everybody. Everybody I graduated with had to uh, move along to find employment somewhere else. So again, it just kind of, it's always something that's been in the back of my mind to, uh, you know, it was always a discussion like who's in power and all that sort of stuff. I don't really want to get into. Did you ever think to yourself, <laughs> I'm going to put my name on the ballot? Was that ever a discussion in your head? My name will be on the ballot see. one day. And that's, a, that's exactly where it started. Uh, did I really think serious about it back then? No, you know what I mean? Didn't have time. But again, it's just always something. It always was a conversation and just always something that uh, I was totally interested in. So so I want to talk about that first election. So uh, the records that I can find, the first election that you stood for was in 2020, correct? Yeah, 2020. Okay, but you said this, your interest in municipal politics dates back to 2012 when you started to notice infrastructure projects that were... Uh, uh, 2000, I say, two, oh, 2000. 2000, 2000, I'm sorry, I apologize. But in 2019, 2020, what was the moment that you went, okay, this is the time, this is it. Uh, after 20 years of being in the on the bleachers, it's time to actually get into the game and put my name on the ballot. What happened in that election that made you decide to jump in? There was probably three factors that uh, not too many people can thank COVID for something, but uh, I can thank COVID for that because what it did was it slowed the world down and uh, allowed me the time to become a counselor where I just didn't have the time before, always too busy kind of thing. Um, um, in 2020, my wife started an online degree, so that keeps her busy, which again freed up more of my time, and uh, everything's all good with that. And uh, the, the funniest part was, is what pushed me over the edge was uh, in April of 2020, COVID just hit, oil was minus 40, 
and I found myself in a job interview, although I haven't lost my job. Um, there was a job that came available. I threw my name in and I found myself in an interview. Um, the interview process was very interesting. Honestly, my whole career, I've never really been through an interview process. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the gentleman that was interviewing me explained that, uh, you know, I'm probably a little overqualified for what they're looking for. It was more of a starter's position, if you will. And, uh, and then he inter he uh, uh, suggested at the very end of the interview, he just looked at me with a dead face and said, have you ever thought about running for politics? And he said, because I would vote for you. So that was how the interview ended. And uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of what pushed me again. It was in... It was on my thoughts and all that stuff, but I can uh, thank him for pushing me over the edge. So, okay, that's the first time that's that no ever anyone's ever told me that a job interview led to getting into politics. But here we are talking to Tony, <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, I was I was uh, shocked and blown away as you are right now. What do you do with that though? Because you don't just randomly go into a job interview expecting someone to say you should run for politics. And then the next day say, I'm going to go file my paperwork with the city and run for politics. What's the process now of going, maybe I should. And how does that interview go to you winning an election? Let's, let's, let's put it on the table here, Tony. Yeah, no, honestly, from that, from the, the, the day I got home, I think it was in the morning that afternoon I got home and, uh, obviously started the search on how to become a counselor, right? So obviously you just think it's running, but oh, there's paperwork to fill out. There's, uh, you know, thing, things to do. So what was just, the biggest just, learning just, curve just, for you for that? that? Sorry, what's that? What was the biggest learning curve? Because there's a lot of people who want to get involved in politics and especially at the municipal level who don't know what they're in for when they start this process. So looking back on that time, what advice would you give to potential counselor uh, candidates who are looking to get involved and get it on the ballot? What, what advice would you give them? Um, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you prepare yourself, but one thing you're not prepared <laughs> for is being in the public eye. Um, you know what I mean? Obviously, I was, I've been involved in, in uh, so many things in the city, but obviously taking that leap forward uh, when your name's out there, um, just having people come up to you and, and either tell you that you can do it or you can't. So it's uh, just taking all that energy and uh, you basically you better, be, you better be prepared for public speaking, which, uh, you know what I mean? I probably wouldn't have been years ago, but just through job job performances and stuff like that. Like I said, as kind of in a manager role towards the end. And, uh, you know, that definitely prepares you for one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, speaking and speaking in public, speaking in groups and stuff like that. That's, that's the biggest hurdle that uh, people will have. You, you talk about how in 2020, the pandemic was happening, but elections still happened during the pandemic, during COVID-19. Um, you seem to have an, a pulse on your community. You see because you get elected, so therefore you have a pulse on your community. During that campaign, though, when you're out talking to your constituents, when you're talking to your neighbors, are there issues that are being brought to your attention that you were not aware that were concerns in your community that you went, I'm glad someone's talking about it because if they're not, then we're not sure if we should be addressing it at council. But now that someone is talking about it, we can come up with a solution if elected in 2020. Yeah, no, kind of the issues surrounding the cities were all, were, it was all kind of out there. Um, and then one thing in the city, like I said, there were bad decisions from 20, uh, 20, 2000 to 2012. Uh, 2012, the city made a, you know, they started writing the wrongs that they were doing and stuff like that. So there, there was a lot of things happening, but uh, like, for good policies that the city was having, but you can always improve on it more. I think the biggest thing with myself was just bringing in a more of a diverse uh, conversation into uh, like, obviously, I don't know how to, how to, how to explain it the best, but you know what I mean? Somebody from my side of the tracks is probably not supposed to be a politician. So it was a, it was a shock to lots of people. But again, uh, the good thing it does is it brings a diverse voice uh, into council. Uh, were there any big issues that I could think of? No, just mainly infrastructure. Like I said, uh, the kind of the funniest part was I did campaign on one of our main arteries that did not have a sidewalk. 
Um, and so lots of businesses, even the, the Walmart is on this street that people couldn't walk to. So it was a campaign promise. Um, and then the funniest part about all that is I kind of campaigned on it here behind the scenes. It was all in the works. Our first, first year or second year we came in, all of a sudden Kensington Avenue has a sidewalk. I got a little bit of the accolades for it, but actually it had nothing to do with it. So right time, right time, right place. So. I want to, I want to talk about election night because election night, all the chips are on the table. All the hard work that you've done putting in that campaign is all off of your shoulders now, because once the voting booth opens and people are voting, you can't do anything about how the chips fall, but the chips fall in your favor on election night. And on election night, the little blue check mark goes beside your name and you are now counselor elect. Take me through that moment when that weight of that check mark of that counselor elect up in front of your name now comes into full force. <laughs> well, you definitely go through a bunch of thoughts. It's it's definitely surreal, um, like something that you set out to do and a goal that becomes accomplished. Um, did I? Obviously, I didn't do it to lose. Uh, was I? I was just kind of shocked and surreal, I guess. Is the and then uh, you kind of go through. Uh, it's like, oh, oh now I got to be, become a counselor. So going through that process, and again, you can uh, you can think you know. Um, as much as you know going into it but honestly one one word of advice to anybody new getting into it is you really don't know and uh, you just have to be a good listener and so, uh but like i said it was, it was just more surreal and uh i guess becoming reality that was the biggest shocker so you you open up a can of worms here and i want to play in that pandora's box for a second because you now have the weight and responsibility on your shoulders that the decisions you make at that council table not only affect you, but affect your community, your neighbors, your family members. How much of a responsibility do you have to go put on your shoulders every time you go into that council meeting to be informed, to be educated, to be prepared for what's coming in front of you? Because I've heard horror stories of councils who just do things behind the scenes and then at council table at the council table, they just openly, okay, vote, we're done, over with. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you get it right? Yeah, it's definitely it's time consuming. Again, it's something that you don't realize the amount of time that goes into it. Um, you gotta be prepared, that's for sure. Uh just even for any interview or whatever, you just gotta be prepared for it. Um, the weight on your shoulders, uh so far, we haven't had anything that, I guess, totally lost sleep over. Um, but there are decisions just daily. And uh, I guess that that is the biggest thing is you just have to uh, believe in yourself and believe in the decision you made. Well, and, while uh, you may well, while you may not lose sleep over it, let's t let's take the budget for example. The budget's always the hardest part of any counselor's job because you are dictating the financial feasibility of a lot of your neighbors and a lot of your community members. And while you need to grow your city, you can't always do it on the back of your community. How do you as counselor look at something like the budget and go, okay, how do we get this right? So we grow the city, but we don't negatively impact the people that are in our community. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, the, the main role is uh, for myself is, is infrastructure and as you say, keeping that budget in line, uh, you're not going to make everybody happy. Uh, but at the end of the day, what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> Politicians not making hundred percent of the population happy. No, no, no. Yeah. But at, at the end of the day, I believe in continuous improvement. Um, one thing I was actually shocked at again, things that you think, you know, going into it was that the, you know, the budget looks really good for the city. Um, there's programs to continuously improve roadways, infrastructure, and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, sidewalks, you know, down to walking paths and all that sort of stuff. So um, that that side of it, that side of it's all good. And like I said, it's the biggest thing is keeping uh, keeping infrastructure continuously improving and uh, keeping that budget in line, right? So That's I want to I want to turn to segment two and segment two is the fun part for me, because this is the part where we actually get to talk about your community. And I want to preface this question by starting with this, by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a motion at counsel. This is his opinion. 
seem to get a lot of emails about this question. Counselor, Tony, in your opinion, today, as of recording, what is the biggest issue facing your city, your community today? We have a massive issue that could roll over into a bunch of issues, but as you stated in the beginning, Estevan is known as the energy city. Um, we have been providing coal-fired electricity since the turn of the century. Um, lots of what the city is, you know what I mean? Obviously, we do have a diverse economy, but uh, coal is front and center in power generation. And as everybody knows, the world wants to shut off coal-fired electricity. Um, that is going to be, uh, it's going to be big to the city. Like I said, it makes up who knows how many jobs. Like you can just think uh, the coal the coal uh, industry in Astavan alone is anywhere from 80 to $100 million in wages per year. You know what I mean? And that, that's going to be missing. Um, that's going to, which that's going to snowball into uh, property values being devalued. And then obviously if the property values go down, even though your mill rate stays the same, you bring in less taxes. So that, that's what the city of Estefan has fun. Uh, we already started that process in 2020, our first year. Um, we thought we were all, we're kind of, we we're about four or four new councillors, I do believe. So we didn't have to increase the mill rate. The budget looked good. Uh, a month later, SAMA comes in into our town takes a bunch of value away and there we find ourselves in a five million dollar deficit just out of nowhere just paper thin so um that's going to probably continue on from you know uh, 2024 2028 that's when sama comes in and does a revaluation so um again and once that deficit gets too big you know where is the money going to come from and that's where it's it's going to have to come from building relationships obviously with provincial and federal governments so, um, so what do you do in the short term, is. though? What do you have to do in the short term? Because, and I, 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 I'm listening to this. What you just said there, and it, the the coal industry in your community is the lifeblood of your community, and I hate to say it that way, but it is. You shut down yeah. that industry, you're not just losing those jobs; you're losing the trickle down effect of that mom pa restaurant, that Walmart, that uh, grocery store. It could have negative impacts on your community. What are you doing in the short term to to not prepare, but to sort of, and I hate to use the word fight back, but say, okay, guys, if you destroy our this community, this or uh, energy resource, it's going to destroy my community, and I'm not for that. Yeah, um, that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm actually here um, to be that voice of energy, to be the cheerleader. Um, although, like I said. Whether you agree with it or not, federally, provincially, even down to SAS power, um, they're making the hugest mistake of their lives. Uh, again, it accounts for 40% of gener power generation currently as we speak. They do have some plans to replace it. But again, what you're asking is uh, all I can do is, uh, you know, voice my opinion. But at the same time, you have to, you can't be... Um, create fear or whatever. Uh, there is other power generation. They will probably will switch the coal over to gas, natural gas. Um, there's talks of uh, the nuclear, first nuclear power plants in Saskatchewan. Um, I'm not asking for them to build it. I kind of want to tell them to build it in Estevan. So we're on, the, we're on the short list, I guess, to build it. So at the end of the day, the energy city still needs to be energy provider. We have geothermal, wind and solar and all that sort of stuff. But uh, all we can do is uh, build relationships and uh, speak our voice and just let the people that are making these decisions know that, yes, you are making a horrible decision, but at the same time, we are game to bring in anything into the city, right? So whether it be nuclear, wind, solar, like I said, we're not, we want to be the energy city still. Uh, we have the workforce, we have the capacity, the infrastructure here for 1200 megawatts. Um, the, the biggest push I'll be making and start to make now is kind of what SAS Power is doing is, unfortunately, they're shutting down. Long story short, they're sending our jobs to North Dakota. So I do want to uh, bring that to their attention. I'm sure they know. Um, 
What do you mean by that? Order. What do you What do you mean by that? Because I just I, I I I try not to do a lot of research because I want to try to be the listener in this uh, the show. So what do you mean by they're sending uh, their workers to North Dakota? Like, are they like just outsourcing, or are they just actually just closing up things and people in North Dakota are picking it up? Just they're gonna, cl- they're clarify gonna, they're, that. They're going to purchase. They're going to purchase the natural gas and coal-fired power from North Dakota. Exactly. What? <laughs> so that's, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. So to bring that back, um, extend, we have the coal-fired power plant. We have a carbon capture facility that's been going for 10 years. So obviously emissions was the problem. Um, Saskatchewan came to the table, found a solution, captured the emissions. And the best part about all that is that CO2 that's captured goes to an old oil field that's uh, 50 kilometers away, might be give or take more than that, but that CO2 gets pumped into the ground and becomes a solvent to the old oil field, which doesn't have to drill anymore, but they can maintain oil production. So again, it's all about saving emissions. And uh, so if they shut down the coal fire, the boundary down three is what it's called, carbon capture. Um, The oil field in Weyburn will still require the CO2 so it won't be coming from SAS Power. It will be coming from North Dakota, which it does already. And that's where it started from, right? So it started coming from North Dakota and the power plant in Esteban that was supposed to save everything, but our everybody just ignores the fact that it eliminated emissions and stuff like that. So, and then uh, there's a, a power connector right now where SAS Power, I think it's 150 megawatts. Nine, nine days out of 10, they're selling power to North Dakota through this. Now they're going to upgrade that to 650. Somehow, miraculously, they're going to switch that power being a seller into an importer. So, again, that's just where uh, all they're doing is uh, shipping our emissions and jobs to North Dakota. So that's that's my mission coming up in the next few years and hopefully so, into the next election so- that I can just bring awareness to that and they can do with it as they will. I'm going to ask a very political question, a very, very political question here. Not municipal politics, but politics in general question. Is your voice being heard? Is Estevan's voice being heard on the provincial and federal stage right now? Because, and I'm not saying your MLA or your MP need to do better, but from when it comes to council, you are the front line of the the people, the community that the community members look up to you and say, you need to advocate for this because you are the front lines of our community. Do you believe your voices are being heard right now in Regina, in Ottawa and saying, okay, guys, we understand, but our community thrives on coal. And if you shut it off tomorrow and you start shipping it to North Dakota, you're not just destroying our community, but surrounding communities as well. Yeah, no, uh, it's definitely... Uh, since my time on council, anyway, every opportunity um, that you know the city and council has been given to get in front of uh, the people, you know, especially myself, um, we we voice the concerns. They know we're here. They know we're the, they know the concerns, but obviously they just keep falling back. It's a federal policy that's that's doing this to us, right? So, at the end of the day, I uh, just there, you need to become reality and. Uh, Sometimes, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no. But what what would you say to? I'm uh, just trying to think of who the energy minister, Jonathan Wilkinson, the energy, the federal energy minister, or Justin Trudeau right now about the city of Estevan and what's happening with the policies, as you say, that are potentially destroying your community. That's just all I can say is it's the worst decision that. Uh, the decision makers are, are making. Like it just, like I said, 40% of generation. Uh, we have the technology to eliminate the emissions, which is what this is all about. Um, and it just really all gets ignored. So uh, um, I don't know. We've we've been in their faces. We've tried to, we're, and again, we're trying to, uh, there's been a few trips to the Ottawa from the mayor and stuff like that. So they know we're here. They know our concerns. And uh, you're just, again, not, it's just not feeling heard. Every, every everything's everything's in their ball court, and uh, that's all. That's all. That's it. That's all it is. So, 
I want to fl- flip the, the 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 first question I asked on its head here for a second because if I go to the city tomorrow and I talk to a hundred people in their community, they will all tell me some macro issues like healthcare, education, energy, but they'll also tell me about micro issues. That pothole in front of my house, that sidewalk that needs to be paved. How do you balance, how do you as counselor, not counsel as a whole, but you as counselor balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Because you want to look at the big picture item, but you also have to remember the small issues that people have are important to them. So how do you look at the people in your community and say, these are the issues that are important to you. I'm going to be your champion for that. Or I can't, we can't deal with that issue right now or that pothole or that sidewalk because it's not in the funding this year it's in the funding for 2025 2026 how do you do that um no matter where i am whatever every inquiry i take whether it be big or small um i look into it okay so and then from that from that point on i either take it take it higher or explain to them that sorry that may not get looked at this year but it's on the list are people right. willing to accept that? Are we, people willing to accept no in your community? Because I, as a politician, the hardest word to ever say to anyone is no. So for you, is it hard to say no to people and say not today, not this year, maybe next year? Um, it's it's always hard. It's always hard. <laughs> but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you just have to you just have to do it again. Again, uh, that's all I can promise is I will look into. Like I said, and I have looked into every inquiry, big or small, and. Uh, Sometimes you get good news from me. Sometimes you don't. And but uh, so far, I would say everybody's whether good or bad have went away with an understanding of why. So, and and that's that's all I can offer. I want to ask a follow up question to this big overarching segment here. Now, if I came to you in December of 2023. So at the end of this year, and I I said, Hey, Tony, what's up? Long time. No talk. Hope, hope you've been doing well. And I, I say to you, so remember back in, uh, when we recorded our episode, I asked you the question, what do you hope to accomplish by the end of 2023 as the town, as the city, sorry, as the city of Estevan, what do you hope to accomplish by the end of this year that you can go to the residents of your community and say, look at guys, it may not be done. It may, or it may be done. This is what we've got done this year. This is the big thing that we worked on, and I'm happy that we got it done. What would be that issue for you that you can say to your people, we got this started or we got this accomplished? Again, and it's just building building those provincial uh, and federal relationships. So what, uh, how, it, how would they look it, it, better at, at the end of the year for you? How would they look better? Um, obviously, the better the relationship you have with someone, the better the outcome. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? So, you know, even in my short time, I have, you know, gained some some relationships with, you know, provincial. Um, I haven't really got to the federal level yet. Obviously, our federal MP, you know, we know very well. But uh, again, so it'll be, you know, by the end of 2023, again, again, it's just building those relationships um, making sure that they know we're here, uh, obviously our concerns, but like I said, whatever, whatever new industry and all that sort of stuff needs to come to Astavan. And again, that's all we can do is be the cheerleader and, uh, and, uh, be a good partner. That, that's, that's the biggest thing is, uh, lots of people think if you go into a meeting and shaking your fist and all sorts of stuff like that, like that doesn't really get you anywhere. It's, it's all about uh, you need to understand each other, and from there, trust starts. And hopefully, we can snowball uh, the energy city into continually to be the energy city. That's that's my biggest thing. Like yeah, the infrastructure, the budget, and everything looks good so far. But again, we'll uh, that'll twenty twenty four will be a big thing on that side of it, right? So while it's not always good to go in shaking your fist sometimes you have to though right sometimes you have to go in and shake your fist and say okay guys enough is enough you're jerking us around in the city and we need some we need an answer and this idea that provincial and federal politics takes a long time to happen municipal as well sometimes you do need to go in there shaking your fist do you not and that that's where my message this is the first time probably anybody's here and that's where my, you know, my new message into uh, next election will be just letting the decision makers know 
you are making the worst decision of your life. So I'll leave it at that. Good way to end. But I want to turn to the next segment now because this is the this is the this is the segment that a lot of people tune in for. But uh, as a tourist, as someone who likes to travel and go to different communities, I like to visit communities that come on the show. So later on this year, I will be in the city of Estevan. So, Tony, for those tourists out there who are coming to your city, what should they stop at? What are the hidden gems? What are the tourist attractions? What are the hot spots that you believe people in Canada and around the world should stop and see? Um. Basically, everything starts in our city with what I call the heartbeat of the city, and it's Affinity Place. It is our it's our arena. Uh, it's our concert hall. It hosts numerous fundraising events. Uh, we've hosted national events. Uh, we just did the Centennial Cup, Junior A, Canadian Championship. We did a Canada Cup curling event, which brought the 16 best teams to Canada, in Canada, to Estevan. Uh, provincial events we just hosted the provincial curling but uh there's been so many concerts so many things it's definitely the heartbeat again it's the heartbeat of the fundraising um and one thing with estevan for tourism is uh, our biggest thing is if you are if you love anything about the outdoors uh we have so much to offer uh everything is we're endless options uh obviously camping golfing all the all the all the normal things and stuff like that. We are surrounded by two reservoirs. Um, uh, we are surrounded by the Suez River. So there's endless possibilities there, sightseeing, kayaking, canoeing, boating, again, whatever whatever your pleasure. Uh, we are the only place in Western Canada that has largemouth bass in our fishery what? at Boundary Dam. What? No, so, yes. no. <laughs> that normally, you? Normally, normally you have to go to Florida North Carolina to fish for largemouth bass, you can do it right here in Estevan, Saskatchewan, and they average three to four pounds. It's phenomenal. I hate them because I can't catch them. <laughs> they, they elude me for some reason, but again, but again, uh, so that that's a that's a little tidbit. Like I said, all sorts of trails, uh, hunting, and uh, honestly, the most magnificent sunsets you'll ever see. What do you do after a stressful day at council, though, after a long day at work, where do you go in the community to decompress, to recenter yourself? And before you answer, I'm going to say this, that I've said to every other councillor mayor, you cannot say your own house. Okay. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of councillors saying I escaped by going into my house. We understand that. But after your house, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> um a good a good thing or a bad thing the way you look at it as a council like i said we uh we agree and disagree but at the end of the day like we are we are a pretty good team and at the end of every council meeting we actually go for a piece of pizza and uh not not beer because we got to drive but we go for a piece of pizza and a coffee and uh not that we discuss anything but there's just different conversations so that deflates a guy a bit right there but again, I'm I'm involved in hockey, curling, and fishing, and like I said, if a, if uh, any anything outdoorsy. But uh, no, that's that's where I guess I go to decompress. And as you said, I can't say my house, so I'll say is what I do is I go lay on the couch, stare at the ceiling, and uh, I review the evening. If you really want to know what I do, so because I can't get to sleep after it's just like a hockey game or something. When I get home from council, it's uh there's adrenaline flowing through your body and, uh, and uh, you have to deflate. I, I want to ask a question that I, sh I was going to ask earlier on, but I didn't because it wasn't appropriate at the time, but you just mentioned something. Sometimes tensions do run high in the council meeting. Sometimes your side might lose because at the end of the day, you're all independent thinkers who all have to sway the majority of your council members to vote for or against your motion. But at the end of the day, after your council meeting, you can go out to have a coffee and a slice of pizza at the local watering hole and just relax and still be friends. How important is that mutual respect around your council table to not let the decisions that you make in council spill over into the public arena? Because 
you all have to go back to work the next day or the next week to that next council meeting and do it all over again. How important is it for you to have that respect and mutual uh, mutual understanding of, you know what, sometimes my side won't win? Uh, what's in the, the easy answer to that is once, once you do lose respect for each other, that's when division starts. Um, again, you are you are your own you are your own person. You uh, you only have one vote, and like I said, you can sway your comments. But uh, at the end of the day, if it doesn't go your way, um, obviously you can think about how you could uh, change it to sway your way the next time. But uh, once you lose respect for each other, it becomes divisions, and probably uh, things don't get done then, right? So. True. Thank you for answering that question. I want to leave on this question and take as long as you want to answer this. In your opinion, what makes the city of Estevan such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, it is obviously just where we're situated. Uh, we are we are down in the southeast corner. Um, what we do, what we do for a living, is provide energy. Pretty much from top to bottom, whether you're in the oil and gas industry, coal industry, um, we provide energy. We work 24-7, 365 days a week, or sorry, a year. Um, and we all come together when, like I said, just for even the events uh, that get posted. Just, just in the past year, like I said, we hosted a national junior A centennial event. Um, it just did a provincial curling event. There was there was concerts, you know. No matter what's happening in the community, is uh, everybody kind of knows each other a little bit. Like we're eleven thousand, but uh, whatever whatever goes on, and uh, when people call out for help, um, we come to each other's help. So that's uh, one thing that uh, sticks out for sure. Perfect. Um, Tony, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last 40 minutes and having this conversation. We often forget that municipal politicians are the front line. Like I said, during the interview of politics, they are the ones that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't go off to Regina. They don't go off to Ottawa. They are in your community and we need to shine a spotlight on these people because People like yourself, Tony, uh, make communities better and they have the best interest in their hearts for their community. And I wish you all the best of luck fighting the fight that Estevan is up against with the federal and provincial governments. And I know with you at the t uh, council table, you will accomplish that. Even if it is shaking your fist in the air sometimes, you might have to do that. So thank you so much for being part of your council, but being part of the show as well. So thank you. I appreciate it. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised at how much it helps our society, helps our community, and helps us be a better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.